War is a Racket by Smedley Butler Chapter 2 Who Makes the Profits? The World War, rather brief participation in it, has cost the United States some $52 billion. Figure it out. That means 400 to every American man, woman, and child. And we haven't paid the debt yet. We are paying it, our children will pay it, and our children's children probably still will be paying the cost of that war. The normal profits of a business concern in the United States are 6, 8, 10, and sometimes 12 percent. But wartime profits, ah, that is another matter. 20, 60, 100, 300, and even 1800 percent. The sky is the limit. All that traffic will bear. Uncle Sam has the money. Let's get it. Of course, it isn't put that crudely in wartime. It is dressed into speeches about patriotism, love of country, and we must put our shoulders to the wheel. But the prophets jump and leap and skyrocket, and are safely pocketed. Let's just take a few examples. Take our friends the DuPonts, the powder people. Didn't one of them testify before a Senate committee recently that their power won the war? Or saved the world for democracy or something? How did they do in the war? They were a patriotic corporation. Well, the average earnings of the DuPonts for the period 1910 to 1914 were six million a year. It wasn't much, but the DuPonts managed to get along on it. Let's look at their average yearly profit during the war years, 1914 to 1918. Fifty-eight million dollars a year of profit, we find. Nearly ten times that of normal times. And the profits of normal times were pretty good. An increase in profits of more than 950%. Take one of our little steel companies that patriotically shunted aside the making of rails and girders and bridges to manufacture war materials. Well, their 1910 to 1914 yearly earnings averaged six million. Then came the war. And like loyal citizens, Bethlehem Steel promptly turned to munitions making. Did their profits jump? Or did they let Uncle Sam in for a bargain? Well, their 1914 to 18 average was $49 million a year. Or let's take United States Steel. The normal earnings during the five year period prior to the war were $105 million a year. Not bad. Then along came the war and up went the profits. The average yearly profit from 1914 to 1918 was $240 million. Not bad. Some of the steel and powder earnings. Let's look at something else. A little copper, perhaps. That always does well in wartime. Anaconda, for instance. Average yearly earnings during the pre-war years, 1910 to 14, of $10 million. During the war years, 1914 to 18, profits leaped to $34 million per year. Or Utah Copper, average of $5 million per year during the 1910 to 14 period, jumped to an average of $21 million yearly profits for the war period. Let's group these five with three smaller companies. The total yearly average profits of the pre war period 1910 to 14 were $137,480,000. Then along came the war. The average yearly profits for this group skyrocketed to 408 million. A little increase in profits of approximately 200%. Does war pay? It paid them. But they aren't the only ones. There are still others. Let's take leather. 
For the three-year period before the war, the total profits of the Central Leather Company were $3.5 million. That was approximately $1.167 million a year. Well, in 1916, Central Leather returned a profit of $15 million, a small increase of 1,100%. That's all. The General Chemical Company averaged a profit for the three years before the war of a little over 800000 a year. Came the war, and the profits jumped to $12 million, a leap of 1,400%. International Nickel Company, and you can't have a war without nickel, showed an increase in profits from a mere average of $4 million a year to $73 million yearly. Not bad. An increase of more than 1,700%. American Sugar Refining Company averaged $2 million a year for the three years before the war. In 1916, a profit of $6 million was recorded. Listen to Senate Document No. 259, the 65th Congress, reporting on corporate earnings and government revenues. Considering the profits of 122 meat packers, 153 cotton manufacturers, 299 garment makers, 49 steel plants, and 340 coal producers during the war. Profits under 25% were exceptional. For instance, the coal companies made between 100% and 7.856,000% on their capital stock during the war. The Chicago Packers doubled and tripled their earnings. And let us not forget the bankers who financed the Great War. If anyone had the cream of the profits, it was the bankers. Being partnerships rather than incorporated organizations, they do not have to report to stockholders. And their profits were as secret as they were immense. How the bankers made their millions and their billions, I do not know, because those little secrets never become public even before a Senate investigatory body. But here's how some of the other patriotic industrialists and speculators chiseled their way into war profits. Take the shoe people. They like war. It brings business with abnormal profits. They made huge profits on sales abroad to our allies. Perhaps, like the munitions manufacturers and armament makers, they also sold to the enemy. For a dollar is a dollar, whether it comes from Germany or from France. But they did well by Uncle Sam, too. For instance, they sold Uncle Sam 35 million pairs of hobnailed service shoes. There were 4 million soldiers. Eight pairs and more to a soldier. My regiment during the war had only one pair to a soldier. Some of these shoes probably are still in existence. They were good shoes. But when the war was over, Uncle Sam has a matter of 25 million pairs left over, bought and paid for. Profits recorded and pocketed. There was still lots of leather left. So the leather people sold your Uncle Sam hundreds of thousands of McClellan saddles for the cavalry. But there wasn't any American cavalry overseas. Somebody had to get rid of this leather, however. Somebody had to make a profit in it. So we had a lot of McClellan saddles. And we probably have those yet. Also, somebody had a lot of mosquito netting. They sold your Uncle Sam 20 million mosquito nets for the use of the soldiers overseas. I suppose the boys were expected to put it over them as they tried to sleep in their muddy trenches, one hand scratching cooties on their backs and the other making passes as scurrying rats. Well, not one of these mosquito nets ever got to France. Anyhow, these thoughtful manufacturers wanted to make sure that no soldier would be without his mosquito net. 
so 40 million additional yards of mosquito netting were sold to Uncle Sam. There were pretty good profits in mosquito netting those days, even if there were no mosquitoes in France. I suppose if the war had lasted just a little longer, the enterprising mosquito netting manufacturers would have sold your Uncle Sam a couple of consignments of mosquitoes to plant in France, so that more mosquito netting would be in order. Airplane and engine manufacturers felt they, too, should get their just profits out of this war. Why not? Everybody else was getting theirs. So one billion dollars, count them if you live long enough, was spent by Uncle Sam in building airplane engines that never left the ground. Not one plane or motor out of the billion dollars worth ordered ever got into a battle in France. Just the same, the manufacturers made their little profit of 30, 100, or perhaps 300 percent. Undershirts for soldiers cost 14 cents to make, and Uncle Sam paid 30 to 40 cents for each of them. A nice little profit for the undershirt manufacturer. And the stocking manufacturer and the uniform manufacturers and the cap manufacturers and the steel helmet manufacturers all got theirs. Why, when the war was over, some four million sets of equipment, knapsacks and the things that go to fill them, crammed warehouse, warehouses on this side. Now they are being scrapped because the regulations have changed the contents. But the manufacturers collected their wartime profits on them, and they will do it all over again next time. There were lots of brilliant ideas for profit-making during the war. One very versatile patriot sold Uncle Sam 12 dozen 48-inch wrenches. Oh, they were very nice wrenches. The only trouble was that there was only ever one nut that was made large enough for these wrenches. That is the one that holds the turbines at Niagara Falls. Well, after Uncle Sam had bought them, and the manufacturer had pocketed the profit, the wrenches were put on freight cars and shunted all around the United States in an effort to find a use for them. When the armistice was signed, it was indeed a sad blow to the wrench manufacturer. He was just about to make some nuts to fit the wrenches. Then he planned to sell these too to your Uncle Sam. Still another had the brilliant idea that colonels shouldn't ride in automobiles, nor should they even ride on horseback. One has probably seen a picture of Andy Jackson riding in a buckboard. Well, some 6,000 buckboards were sold to Uncle Sam for the use of kernels. Not one of them was used. But the buckboard manufacturer got his war profit. The shipbuilders felt they could come in on some of it, too. They built a lot of ships that made a lot of profit. More than $3 billion worth. Some of the ships were all right but $635 million worth of them were made of wood and wouldn't float. The seams opened up, and they sank. We paid for them, though, and somebody pocketed the profits. It has been estimated by statisticians and economists and researchers that the war cost your Uncle Sam $52 billion. Of this sum... 39 billion was expended in the actual war itself. This, this expenditure yielded 16 billion in profits. That is how the 21,000 billionaires and millionaires got that way. This 16 billion in profits is not to be sneezed at. It is quite a tidy sum, and it went to a very few. The Senate I committee probe of the munitions industry and its wartime profits, despite its sensational disclosures, hardly has scratched the surface. 
Even so, it has had some effect. The State Department has been studying, for some time, methods of keeping out of war. The War Department suddenly decides it has a wonderful plan to spring. The administration names a committee, with the War and Navy Departments ably represented under the chairmanship of a Wall Street speculator, to limit profits in wartime. To what extent isn't suggested? Hmm. Possibly the profits of 300 and 600 and 1600 percent of those who turned blood into gold in the World War would be limited to some smaller figure. Apparently, however, the plan does not call for any limitation of losses, that is, the losses of those who fight the war. As far as I have been able to ascertain, there is nothing in the scheme to limit a soldier to the loss of but one eye or one arm, or to limit his wounds to one or two or three, or to limit the loss of life. There is nothing in this scheme, apparently, that says not more than 12% of a regiment shall be wounded in battle, or that not more than 7% in the division shall be killed. Of course, the committee cannot be bothered with such trifling manners. End of chapter 2